their role is as it has, has always been, uh, to, to celebrate, to complain, to convince, to express aspirations, visions, fears, all of those things. The story of murals, like any story, can be told short or long. <laughs> short version, first loyalist mural, well first unionist mural, I'll, I'll make that clarification in a minute. First unionist mural is 1908. Coming up to the 12th of July, it was uh, painted as part of that celebration of the 12th when there are marches, bonfires, uh, flags, bunting arches over the road. One, you know, for, for many, many years, it was the unionist celebration of being one big happy family, as it were, on their big day of the year celebrating their folk hero par excellence, King William of Orange. The grandfather would have been the first uh, alone with my father, uh, way back in the early sort of 20s. And then they'd been touched up coming up to our marching season, which is the 12th of August, the festival week before it. Uh, they've been sort of touched up on a yearly basis. You know, the, the work and the detailing and stuff like that that goes into one of those paintings is unbelievable. Like I was around when my father was repainting the King William and the Relief one and it took him nearly a year to paint the two paintings. The first main change you see is actually not until the 1980s when for the first time the Loyalist paramilitary groups began to take over control of the walls. In effect what they painted was advertisements for themselves men with guns, men with hoods, uh, we're better than you, we're bigger, we're more proficient, uh, and so on and so on and so on. And basically from about 1986 up till relatively recently, the Loyalist commanders have controlled the walls, which means that basically you don't get to paint on a Loyalist wall unless they give you permission, or better still, unless they commission you to paint something there. Now, that's a problem because there are other voices on the Unionist side that don't get to appear on the walls. In one sense, the Republican murals story is even shorter because for most of the period, they didn't paint murals. Main reason for that is that they couldn't have got away with it, with it if they tried. You didn't get to express Republican or even nationalist uh, aspirations or symbolism in public space. That changed in 1981 with the hunger strike. Some of the prisoners, and particularly Bobby Sands, they wrote messages on, basically on, on toilet paper or on um, paper for rollies for cigarettes, really miniature, and rolled them up, wrapped them in cling foil, and smuggled them out through some orifice or other out of the prison. So they were sending out comms to the wider movement saying, listen, a really good idea in terms of propagating this notion of what we're fighting about would be to do some murals on the walls. So the prisoners were already suggesting that, even to the point early on where they sent out suggestions for designs of possible murals. People began to go out demanding uh, support for the hunger strikers, uh, that they get their political status back. They wrote slogans on the wall, they began to paint pictorial images and the, the Republican mural tradition was born. It's still very much alive. It's been very different from the Loyalist tradition in the sense that Republicanism is a broader church and all the different elements of that church, as it were, get to express themselves publicly. So you could be a Republican feminist, a Republican trade unionist, a Republican supporter of the Cuban Revolution, a, Republicly, a Republican anti-apartheid activist or whatever and you all get to paint on the walls. They're not controlled by one faction, and certainly not by the military faction. You know, the bog side was dominated by army bases. Uh, one inside the walls uh, at the Masonic base, and one uh, at Rosemount, and one at and the top of Craigan. So what you had was a community in the valley and in the valley sides, which was under surveillance, you know, right through the troubles, uh, when the conflict became the conflict between, you know, essentially the IRA and the British Army, 
uh, the, communi the, the community was very much under surveillance. So there was a relationship established between the watcher and the watched, and uh, the murals were part of that expression. So this was a communication to the watchers, the British uh, army, British establishment, British media, from the community. It was their front page, you know, it, it was the equivalent of, of a press release, you know, that the state might have put out through the Daily Mirror or the Sun or whatever. This was the way the community would get their message across. The Fountain always has been a Protestant working class community that just lived outside the walls. When the Protestant community migrated across the, the river, this is the single Protestant area remaining on the, on the west bank of the river. We have a lot of murals around the youth club, as you can see, and we're very interested in, in retaining the, the history and the culture of the area. So we have funded by the Department of Social Development. We now have 12 um, shared history murals up, and that was actually set up to let the young people see the history of how the fountain used to look, what old buildings was on the fountain, because obviously they're all demolished now. And it was just to retain that that culture for the young people and they're very interested in it. Murals like that, uh, Lloyd's community side, they have a great respect, respect for them, uh, mainly because of what they stand for, were Protestant culture and traditions. But more recently they have now started to change to Ulster Scott sort of part of heritage, you know, that sort of way. Uh, so paintings of King Billy and things like that are nearly a thing of the past now. Like. All the murals change. They are constantly being destroyed by the people who painted them because they want the wall to do or say something else. Loyalists say, currently, are very upset over the removal of the flag from the City Hall. There are, although there are a lot of slogans and a lot of marches, you're not going to see a lot of murals specifying that, right? But what you do see is an upsurge in heavy-duty militaristic murals. So if you know the, the time period, if you know what's going on in the politics and the society, you can say, ah, that makes sense, that's why they're doing that. So there is a topicality to them, but it's not explicit necessarily in the mural. And on the Republican side, the topicality can often be more explicit. So, for example, while you will frequently get murals about Palestine, it's when the Israeli Defence Forces start bombarding Gaza that you'll see an uprise or, or, or an upsurge in murals about Gaza. Uh, in the most recent period there, there were, I think, six different murals in Belfast and at least one in Derry that referred to the bombardment of, of Gaza and the 2,000 plus deaths. The international references in, in the Republican murals, it's, it's fairly easy for them in a sense uh, compared to, to loyalists in that when loyalists look around the world they, and, and sort of ask themselves the question, who is like us? They don't get many answers coming back. Uh, in fact, part of the problem for loyalism, and indeed for all of us because we live in the same narrow ground together, is their uh, sense of isolation, their sense of, of uniqueness and, and, and being under siege and having the whole world at best not understanding, standing them and at worst despising them. So, you know, with the possible exception of Israel, there's not much referencing to other places other than here that goes on in loyalist murals. Republicans look around the world and whether you agree or not, they see resonances of their own situation. They say, look, there's a place where people are being repressed by the state. There's a colonial situation. There's an anti-colonial situ situation. There's a hunger strike going on. There's a civil rights campaign going on. And they say, yeah, we, we went through, or we're going through all of that, so we identify with Palestinians, Basques, Catalans, uh, South Africans, Native Americans, African Americans, uh, Cubans, Chilean, Chileans, etc., etc., etc. And on one occasion, uh, Australian Aboriginals. There was one mural about that. There's a lot of money goes into murals now from different sources, including through a programme run through the Arts Council called the Reimaging Communities Programme. And 
because of such things and community relations grants and things like that, there's not only an encouragement but also a, a, a requirement that you show cross-community collaboration. Um, I think that at the best the murals have done this task and continue to do this task at their best they can they can convince people to move forward they can be a crucial part of conflict transformation the murals played key element on the on the republican side in terms of convincing the population the, the nationalist and republican population to go along with the ceasefire to go along with the peace process to go along to, with elections to a building that they'd hated from the day they were born stormont the parliament building to go along with policing all really difficult changes not just for the politically astute people but for the you know the punters out there the communities who had experienced this war and in their different ways to some degree or other um, identified with what was happening Lay me out across the grave. part of the pressure part of the trick in a sense of the last eight to ten years has been to try to end that monopoly that the loyalist commanders have to basically open up the walls to other voices to say you know what what is it that moves unionism and not just the loyalist military side of unionism uh, what is their vision what are their fears what do they want to say And there's no denying that because of where they're coming from, Republicans have been more sh shrewd politically, more articulate, more organised, more, well, better at politics in many ways than working class uh, unionists. So that's an element in it. But the last point I would make is to say that I think that they have been badly served by their leadership in terms of, in terms of selling this to them. And, it, you know, I, I'm not a loyalist. If I was, I probably wouldn't get a chance to say this. But to me, um, there's an inevitability to the way we're going. We're not going back to war, right? So whatever the future is, it's going to be much like the last 20 years in terms of uh, an equality agenda, uh, social construction and political construction, in terms of conflict transformation. These things are all going to happen. And unless you're in there, you will not influence the way they're going to happen. I think it is possible, remarkably, to square a circle here in Northern Ireland. I, it's possible to get a situation where everybody wins something, right? Uh, but to say it in terms of winning and losing doesn't help get us to that point. So there, there are problems and there, there are real issues going on in the executive at the moment whereby they can't agree on on much at all so it's not all rosy but as i say i think the tra trajectory is is that direction rather than that one <laughs>